Okay, today's video is going to be a bit more scripted deep dive on student loans, as you probably saw from the thumbnail. I am a normie with no legal knowledge besides what I've picked up on from YouTube, like the rest of us, you know. That's hearsay, I guess. Well, then. I'm learning. And to be clear, I am slightly biased, as I do have student loan debt, so I would be helped out, and I will acknowledge that if the student loan forgiveness went through, I would be a person that would benefit from it, so... I was a little curious and all this just to investigate like what was blocking it and what happened or like what's all going on. So I decided why not try to explain it and do a little video on it as well. You know, help explain to others that were confused like me. I did not know how many rabbit holes I was going to go down while researching this. So here we are. So to start, I'm going to go through a bit of a summary of history of student loans who all gets loans and what the different types of loans are. Then I'll do a quick summary of loan forgiveness history in general up to this point, and then like the loan forgiveness program being pushed by the Biden administration before I'll go into like what the lawsuits are and who the states are that are appealing the loan forgiveness. And we'll look into like the people that filed the lawsuit against the forgiveness. Just curious. Most seeming to be the attorney general of the different states that are involved. So if you know about the history of student loans, you can skip to this point in the video if you don't want to hear about the history. If you know or don't care about student loan information in general, you can skip to this point for just the loan forgiveness part. Or if you know the general idea of loan forgiveness, the history of it, and you're more interested in just like the normies understanding of who and why people are fighting the student loan forgiveness, then you go ahead and skip to this point. But yeah, so this is going to take a bit. Even recording this is going to take forever. Researching this took forever. Writing the script, like bullet points, took forever. But we're here. We're recording. It's happening. Let's go. It's going to take a while. Get comfy. All right, so let's go into the history of student loans in general. One of the questions I had was like, when did student loans start? And they started in England a long time ago where people would offer collateral, usually like a trunk with a bunch of stuff in it to the university to hold for the student. And then they would pay back to get their collateral back. But student loans were actually first offered in America to students going to Harvard University. And the Harvard students didn't need any collateral at all. The school just gave zero interest loans directly to certain students. And that had like no government involvement at all at that point. It wasn't until the GI Bill passes in 1944 that the US government did anything as far as loans which was to help World War II veterans get money to go to college for free or for very cheap. In the following years, veterans would actually make up nearly half of those attending college. Student loans went federal and really took off in 1958 as a result of the Soviet Union beating us to space. So the U.S. government implemented a federal student loan program under the National Defense Education Act for high school students who showed promise in mathematics, science, engineering, foreign languages. Also for those that wanted to become teachers, they were offered grants, scholarships, and student loans. Student loans became even more accessible in the late 60s under the Higher Education Act of 1965. This law gave federal funds directly to state schools for low interest loans and initiated the Federal Family Education Loan Program, so FFELP, is its acronym to be short. It started as a way to encourage more people to go to college and give access to lower income people. The Basic Education Opportunity Grant was passed in 1972 and was renamed in 1980 for Senator Claiborne Pell, who led the effort to get it passed. It was designed to offer gift aid, which didn't need to be repaid to the neediest of college hopefuls, known as the Pell Grant. And as more people were able to go to college, the price of college increased. The Higher Education Amendments of 1992 created FAFSA, the Direct Lending Program, an unsubsidized Stanford loans, which meant that now students had to cover their own interest costs while in school rather than the federal government. 
which up to this point, the federal government was subsidizing student loans. So this is when we're beginning to see the modern day student loan system that we have now. The Student Loan Reform Act passed in 1993 officially implements the direct lending program, which means the government can now directly lend to the student borrowers instead of through the college or university itself, which had been really the only system in place since 1965. Economic Growth and Tax Reconciliation Act in 2001 made student loan payments tax deductible for borrowers. The Higher Education Reconciliation Act passed in 2005, which reduced loan fees from 4% to 1% and allowed graduate students to take out PLUS loans. This now makes the outstanding student loan debt being $391 billion. By 2006 and 2007, the debt was uh, just about $500 billion, but then in 2008, it got a bit out of hand as the recession hit. More people went back to college to switch up their life and get a career that's a little different than what they had before. With credit market problems forcing many private lenders to back out of the FFELP program, as they no longer have the financial ability to provide loans to college students, student loan debt is sitting at $639 billion. Direct-to-consumer private loans were the fastest growing segment of education finance. The percentage of undergraduates obtaining private loans from 2003-2004 year to the 2007-2008 year rose from 5% to 14% and was under legislative scrutiny due to their lack of school certification, especially as online schools began to build in popularity. Legislation under Obama administration in 2010 eliminates the FFELP and now requires all new federal student loans to be direct loans as part of the Direct Lending Program, which was launched in 1993. And at this time, private lenders have began offering private student loans to students independently from the government. So the Outstanding student loan debt is now at $811 billion by 2010. In June of 2010, the amount of student loan debt held by Americans exceeded the amount of credit card debt held by Americans. And student loan debt was 80% federal and 20% private, equaling to $830 billion. In 2015, Pay As You Earn revised by President Obama's direction the Department of Education officially launched the revised pay-as-you-earn method for federal loan borrowers. In that same year, Obama unveiled the Student Aid Bill of Rights by the fourth quarter of 2015. Total outstanding student loans owned surpassed $1.3 trillion. Trillion dollars. So in March of 2020, the coronavirus pandemic pushed the federal government to put all federal student loans in pandemic forbearance which means that no payments were required and no interest would incur. In January of 2021, the newly formed Biden administration extends the pandemic forbearance until October of 2021, which has been extended again until June 30th. So payments will begin 60 days after that as of now, which has our outstanding student loan debt sitting at $1.7 trillion. Borrowing has actually been on the decline as rates of federal student loan borrowing fell annually from the 2011-12 year to the 2017-18 year, with the last class of borrowers taking out $15.7 billion less than the borrowers had five years earlier. Still, the cumulative debt has continued to climb, mainly due in part to delinquency and defaulting. About 11% of borrowers were at least 90 days late on their payments before the pandemic, according to repayment data released by the Department of Education in 2021. Just 1.2% of borrowers were continuing to pay down their loans during the over two years optional deferment, and about one third of borrowers never pay off their loans at all. Those who default end up shifting their burden to the taxpayers, so taxpayers foot those bills. The history of student loans done. All right, so that is the history of student loans done. Overall debt statistics sitting at the direct loans being $1.15 trillion with 34.2 million borrowers. The FFEL loans are at $281.8 billion with 13.5 million borrowers, and that program is the one that ended in 2010. The Perkins loan 
has 7.1 billion, so 2.3 million borrowers. That program ended in 2018 which has our total at 1.4392 trillion with 42.9 million borrowers. So now who takes out student loans and what kind of loans are there? A student loan is a type of loan designed to help students pay for post-secondary education fees such as tuition, books and supplies, and sometimes living expenses. So a lot of kids that go into college do have to get loans to be able to afford it. And stats find that it says about 66% of graduates from public college had loans, 68% of graduates from private colleges had loans, and 83% of graduates from for-profit and non-profit colleges had loans. And that's according to the 2016 data from a April 2019 report that was released. So on average, only 30% of college students don't borrow any loans. When you're applying for college or the universities that you wanna to go to, if you are accepted, you're usually given information on the types of scholarships and loans and grants that are available to you to apply for. So you generally, as far as I know, go to FAFSA, that's how I did it, and apply, usually having to have a parent co-sign for you. It doesn't cover all the costs of college, so parents might have to step in to help cover the semester fees or some people will get a private loan to help cover the difference and others end up having to work during the time that they go to school which is me i'm others i worked while going to school so there were a lot of days that were easily a 16 hour day between getting up and having to drive an hour to school being there drive an hour back go to work and then go home there were some months that i struggled and my parents actually helped me out and did help cover some of the payments, but I did try to pay as much as I could on my own. I will say though that if I didn't have their help, I'm not sure I would have graduated with a degree. I went to a trade school. I don't regret going to college, but I do feel like it was the connections and the friendships that I made that helped me advance and get work in the career rather than the classes themselves. I'm, I'm not sure I learned much. But, I mean, it might be like that at other trade or art schools, but I only have that as a basis for me to go off of. But it does make it a bit difficult to make close friendships when you have to work and then after your day in class, drive all the way back to the city just to work. It was pain, but I got through it. I just definitely missed out on making more friendships than I could have. I did manage to make some lifelong friends from there. And I made it through, but the struggle was real, and I still have debt from all of that. Some of my friends from college are just now finishing paying off that student loan debt from 2010. And I still have a bit. Yeah, the struggle has been real. Sorry, side tangent done. Anyways, so yeah, you apply for loans, but you'll still have to probably work or have someone help pay while you're in school. So now to the different types of loans that you can get and what they are. There are two main types of student loans, and those are federal loans and private loans. And a quick note is this might get confusing. Undergraduate programs require a high school diploma, so you go there straight out of high school, and which graduate programs require a bachelor's degree. So you've already went to some college and then you're going on to like more college. A federal student loan means that the US Department of Education is your lender, and there are four types of these direct loans available and they are direct subsidized loans, direct unsubsidized loans, direct plus loans, and direct consolidation loans. Direct subsidized and direct unsubsidized loans are the most common type of federal student loans for undergrad and graduate students. Nearly all students are eligible to receive federal loans. You must be enrolled at least half time, working toward a degree or a certificate. Unsubsidized Stafford loans are available to all students regardless of financial need. Stafford loans go into repayment status six months after you graduate or drop below half-time status. These loan programs offer deferment and forbearance options for students who cannot pay their loan payment due to financial hardship or need. Most have a 10-year repayment limit but do offer extended loan limits with loan consolidation. Some undergraduate Stafford loans are subsidized. Loan amounts are limited. Direct subsidized loans are made to eligible undergraduate students who demonstrate financial need to help cover the costs of the higher education at a college or career school. 
Direct unsubsidized loans are loans made to eligible undergraduate and graduate and professional students, but eligibility is not based on financial need. Unsubsidized loans are also guaranteed, but interest occurs during the study. Nearly all students are eligible for these loans, regardless of financial need. Direct Plus loans are loans made out to graduate or professional students and parents of dependent undergraduate students to help pay for education expenses not covered by other financial aid. Eligibility is not based on financial need, but a credit check is required. These have much higher loan limits, usually enough to cover costs that exceed student financial aid, and payments start immediately after the education ends. Although prepayment is allowed, credit history is considered, thus approval is not automatic. Interest occurs during the time the student is in school. The parents are personally responsible for a repayment and the parents sign the mastery promissory note and are accountable for the loan. Parents are advised to consider their monthly payments. Plus loans consider credit history, making it more difficult for low income parents to qualify. Direct consolidation loans allow you to combine all of your eligible federal student loan into one single loan with a single loan service provider. So all those other loans you can put into like one big. Okay, so that is federal student loans. Now private student loans. Private loans are offered by banks or finance companies, not the government. They are not guaranteed by our government agency Private loans cost more, offer less favorable terms, and are generally used only when students have exhausted the federal borrowing limit. They are not eligible for income-based repayment plans and frequently have less flexible payment terms, higher fees, and more penalties than federal student loans. They cannot be discharged through bankruptcy. The advantage of private student loans is that they do not include loan or total debt limits, so you can get like a large amount. They typically offer a no payment grace period of six months, and most experts actually recommend private loans only as a last resort because of their less favorable terms. Private student loans generally come in two types, school channel and direct to consumer. School channel loans offer borrowers lower interest rates, but generally take longer to process. These loans are certified by the school, which means the school signs off on the borrowing amount and that the funds are directly distributed to the school. The certification means only that the school confirms that the loans that they are given will be used for the education expenses only and agrees to hold them and disperse them as needed. Certification does not mean that the school approves of or is responsible or has even examined the loan terms itself. Like basically saying we accept the money but we don't endorse or coerce you into getting it. They are not liable to pay it back if you flake. That's all on you to have to pay this back to this entity. They're just taking the money and you owe it. Where direct to consumer private loans do not actually involve the school at all. The student supplies enrollment verification to the lender and then the loan is dispersed directly to the student. While direct to consumer loans generally carry higher interest rates than school channel loans. They allow the family access to loans quicker, in some cases just a matter of days. So this convenience comes at a risk of students over borrowing and or using the funds for inappropriate purposes. I knew a kid like that. So now some quick facts about student loans that I found interesting while researching. According to the Harvard Business School, who started student loans to begin with? Harvard, you know, ah ha ha. When student debt is erased, a huge burden is lifted and people take steps to improve their lives. They seek higher paying careers in new states, improve their education, and get other finances in order to make more substantial contributions to the economy. In 2020, a majority of economists surveyed by the Initiative on Global Markets felt that forgiving all student loan debts would actually be more beneficial to higher income earners than lower income earners. Some critics of financial aid say in general that it allows schools to raise their fees to accept unprepared students and to produce too many graduates in some fields of study. While college grads earn about 70% more than people with only a high school degree, student loan debt has been associated with several social, economic, and physiological consequences, including 
having to choose less satisfying work that pays more, lower credit ratings for missed payments that may disqualify borrowers from opportunities given their poor payment history, reduced wealth accumulation, reduced housing access, delayed marriages, delayed childbirth, and increased anxiety. A Federal Reserve Bank of New York staff report concluded that institutions were more exposed to increases in student loan program maximums tended to respond with disproportionate tuition increases. In the 20 years between 1987 and 2007, the tuition costs have rose 326%. Public universities increased their fees by 27% between the years of 2007 and 2012, or 20% adjusted for inflation. By contrast, the government funding per student fell 27% between 2007 and 2012. Some universities steered borrowers to preferred lenders that charged higher interest rates. Some of these lenders were actually paid kickbacks to university financial aid staff. After that behavior became public, many universities rebated fees to affected borrowers, aka had to pay stuff back. And with a 2007 false claims lawsuit, filed on behalf of the federal government by the former education researcher John Omberg against Sally Mae Nelmet and other lenders. Oberg argued that the lenders overcharged the U.S. government and defrauded taxpayers of over $22 million. Sally Mae and Nelmet are the largest lenders and are frequently defended in a lot of these same lawsuits and a lot of lawsuits like this. In August of 2010, Nelnet settled and paid $55 million. Ultimately, the seven lenders returned taxpayer funds as a result of these lawsuits. The federal government offers loans to students at low-quality institutions, even when we know those students won't boost their earnings and that those borrowers won't be able to repay their loans. And Parent Plus loans are pushed to the poorest families when they know they almost surely will default and have their wages and Social Security benefits garnished and their tax refunds confiscated, as $2.8 billion was in 2017. We have several million students with loans to enroll in untested online programs that seem to offer no labor market value. It is an outrage that our lending programs encourage schools like USC to charge $107,000 for a master's degree in social work, which is 220% more than the equivalent course at UCLA in a field where the median wage is only 47000 a year. It's no wonder the, how many borrowers feel that student loans led to an economic catastrophe. So now we know who gets loans, when they get them, and the types that they are, and just a few random facts that I will cut into here. So let's get into the debt forgiveness part, starting with its history. Congress established the first income-driven repayment plan in 1994, which forgives a borrower's remaining debt within 25 years of being on the program. The PSLF program, which was established under the College Cost Reduction and Access Act of 2007, permits direct loan borrowers who make 120 qualifying monthly payments, aka at least the minimum amount, under a qualifying repayment plan, so you would apply and then be on that plan, while working for a full-time qualifying employer, so only certain jobs, will apply to have that remainder of their student loan forgiveness balance forgiven. Federal Student Aid began accepting and reviewing applications from borrowers seeking loan forgiveness under the Public Service Loan Program, the PSLF, in the fall of 2017. So the 120 qualifying months time is finally done for everybody that applied in 2007, so 2017, so 10 years. On August 21st of 2019, Donald Trump ordered the loan forgiveness for permanently disabled veterans, saving 25,000 veterans an average of 30,000 each. In July of 2021, the U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that private student loans are dischargeable in bankruptcy, following two other cases. In August of 2021, the Biden administration announced it would use executive action to cancel 5.8 billion dollars in student loans held by 323,000 people who are permanently disabled. And now to the final chapter and to the point of this video. Yes, I got a bit sidetracked and we're getting back on track. Here we go. We're, we're getting there. The debt forgiveness plan. During the 2020 presidential election, 
Then candidate Joe Biden said he planned to allow $10,000 in debt forgiveness to all student loan debtors during his term. On August 24th of 2022, Biden announced that he would forgive federal student loan with an amount of $10,000 and an additional $10,000 for Pell Grant recipients, with this relief limited to singles earning under $125,000 and married couples earning under $250,000, including refunding payments during the forbearance period by any borrower who requests it. This will reduce debt for an estimated 43 million borrowers and eliminate student loan debt altogether for an estimated 20 million. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that it will cost the government about 400 billion. Also proposed a new income-driven repayment plan that is being pushed forward with the program and announced that it will put a pause on federal student loan repayment that would be extended through the remainder of 2022. Some borrowers still have loans that were issued under the FFELP program which had closed in the 2010. The Biden forgiveness plan originally allowed these borrowers to receive forgiveness by consolidating into direct loans, but due to potential lawsuits, they stopped allowing this on September 29th of 2022, potentially excluding 800,000 FFEL borrowers. The plan has been shut down as of now, leaving the 26 million borrowers who have already applied for debt relief in financial limbo. Biden's plan was first struck down in November of 2022 by a Texas federal court judge, meaning the plan was not only halted, but it's on pause for now while it goes up to the big courts. But the Department of Education still seems pretty confident that they can re prevail. In response, the Biden administration is extending the federal student loan repayment pause until after June 2023 or whenever the student loan forgiveness plan is able to move forward if it wins the appeal. The Biden administration has already filed an appeal with the case that's going to the Supreme Court, so a quick resolution is unlikely. The Biden administration is also appealing another adverse ruling by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, that's the six states, with 16 million borrowers that have already been approved for forgiveness and were told with an email saying that we will discharge your approved debt if and when we prevail in court by the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. While those payments are currently frozen, the Biden administration has also been forced to stop accepting and processing applications. The Texas federal court judge does not believe that the Biden administration has the authority to cancel the student loan debt. Even under the HEROES Act of 2003, this act does state that the Secretary of Education has the expansive power to alleviate the hardship to student loans that borrowers may experience as a result of national emergencies. There are a lot of rules under the HEROES Act that allow the President's administration to have more authority under extraordinary circumstances, but the judge does not feel Biden can use a national emergency for this. Many Republicans see Biden's plan as a misinterpretation of the law because the pandemic is no longer considered a national emergency. While COVID cases are still the cause of nearly 2,000 deaths per week, the Biden administration declared the pandemic over in September, which may not work out in his favor. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals believes that there may be potential harm to state revenue since a major loan servicer headquartered in Missouri, which feeds money into the state treasury, will lose revenue on the interest if the debt is forgiven. There may be some important precedent, however, to getting student loan forgiveness past party lines. Like the US government was able to forgive $755 billion worth of paycheck protection program loans, which were designed to help small businesses keep workers employed during the onset of the pandemic. These loans have essentially become government grants now, with 91% of the loans being fully or partially forgiven. In contrast, the Congressional Budget Office estimates one-time student loan forgiveness will cost $400 billion. The PPP loan forgiveness was meant to help the economy stay afloat by ensuring people had the means to spend rather than student loans may not be so different. One-time student loan forgiveness does free up that cash that can go to other places that helps spark the economy growth and help the economy in other ways. We can hope that even if the Biden administration fails to enact relief, that they can still put their new income-driven repayment plan into effect. Currently, the IDR plan allows borrowers to make 
monthly payments based on discretionary income, then after 25 years of payment, balances are forgiven. Biden's new IDR plan will be forgiven after 10 years of payments for original loan balances of $12,000 and cover all interest accrual. This means borrowers' balances will not grow based on interest as they meet their monthly contributions. People with loan balances greater than their income usually have to resort to these income-driven repayment plans just to make the payment affordable, but even as they're making payments, their balances is growing because of the interest. So this new plan would be more generous and help make forgiveness more attainable. This new IDR plan is even more impactful than a one-time forgiveness as it would make monthly payments far more manageable for people and then they would continue to pay it over a 10-year time. Just recently, the Supreme Court said the President Joe Biden's student loan debt forgiveness program will remain blocked for now, but the justices agreed to hear oral arguments in the case starting in February, so now, of 2023, with the decision expected by June of 2023. So, for those that plan to pay their loans off, these changes are definitely impactful. So that's where the student loan forgiveness is at, currently. But I wanted to take a deeper look at what was these lawsuits like who what what happened what who's doing this who's fighting it i was just curious when i heard about all this going so this is how this whole thing started right here all the rest of this is research starting with the first one the texas one this lawsuit was filed by the job creators network foundation a conservative group which we'll get into in a second on behalf of two borrowers who did not qualify for the debt relief program in Biden's plan. They say this attempted illegal student loan bailout would have done nothing to address the root cause of unaffordable tuition. Greedy and bloated colleges that raise tuition far more than inflation year after year while sitting on 700 billion in endowments. According to a statement released by Elaine Parker, the chief communications officer, of the Job Creators Network Foundation. You acknowledge the system in place is fucked and your idea is do nothing? That's that's a good idea. So who are these two qualifiers that did not qualify? Ms. Brown, one of two plaintiffs in the Texas lawsuit, is a 1993 graduate of UT El Paso who also attended SMU, who currently has more than $17,000 in private loan debt. If the department is going to provide debt forgiveness, Ms. Brown believes that her student loan debt should be forgiven too. You didn't get money from the government. The initial complaint said she believes it is irrationally arbitrary and unfair to exclude her from the program because her student loan debt is commercially held, aka private loans, and not in default. It's not our fault you took a loan out from a bank for yourself and have to pay that back. She also owns a sign making business and she was granted a $48,000 loan of which $47,996 was forgiven on April. So she only had to pay back $4. Mr. Taylor, the other plaintiff in the suit, attended the University of Dallas. He has a debt totaling more than $35,000. The suit argues that he should receive the full amount of forgiveness, so he wants the $20,000 even though he didn't have a Pell Grant, arguing that he shouldn't have to be penalized because he did not or was not able to receive a Pell Grant in college. Mr. Taylor makes less than $25,000 a year, but he is ineligible for the full $20,000 in debt forgiveness. Attorneys say in the suit, so because he can't get the full amount, no one else should get any. This case is one of a flurry of right-wing lawsuits aimed at ending Biden's student debt forgiveness program. Though many have been dismissed due to a lack of standing, this one was not. So there are plaintiffs in this matter, but who is Elaine Parker and the Job Creators Network Foundation? Also, who is Mark T. Pittman, the U.S. District Court Judge for the Northern District of Texas? Elaine Parker is the Chief Communications Officer for the Job Creators Network and the president of the organization's research education arm. Parker previously worked in public relations for Chrysler, then worked as an independent consultant, and Parker is reportedly compensated at $220,000 annually. So she's doing pretty good. The Job Creators Network Foundation is based in Texas and Georgia. JCN is comprised of two nonprofit organizations, the Job Creators Network and the Job Creators Network Foundation. 
We'll just call them JCN for now as that's a mouthful. Bernie Marcus, a founder and former CEO of Home Depot, organized the group in 2010. They also applied for a PPP loan, getting $133,000, the amount forgiven being $135,000. So that included any interest that they said the money would go to payroll. They do believe in bailouts for companies, it seems, just not people. They're also big proponents of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, lowering taxes for the higher tax brackets while raising them on the lower. While Senate was set to vote on repealing the health law, the JCN announced a partnership with Newt Gingrich to turn Congress's attention toward tax cuts, who desperately needed some sort of legislative accomplishment but at the same time, the network was also making a last ditch effort to push Obamacare repeal through Congress. It has partnered with almost 100 other national, state, and even lo local lobbying groups. In Colorado, for example, it weighed in against a ballot initiative to raise the minimum wage. JCN has ties to notorious PR flack Richard Berman, the president of Berman & Berman Co. Berman, who specializes in front groups and misleading PR campaigns. Berman has spent millions of dollars on a campaign literally attacking the Humane Society. Another quick note, a front group is an organization that purports to represent one agenda while in reality it serves some other party or interest whose sponsorship is hidden or rarely mentioned. This has been called out for a much deeper and well-organized effort by the GOP to use what borders on workplace intimidation to influence the vote. According to Kane, JCN was designed to equip job creators with information they can pass on to their employees to counteract the propaganda they hear from Democrats and from the media. JCN assists its members, corporations, in pressuring their employees to lobby for the corporate agenda through what it calls Employer to Employee Communications Program, or E2E. Example of E2E communications is the Westgate Resort CEO, David Siegel, emailing his 7,000 employees just before the 2012 presidential election, threatening that if any new taxes are levied on me or my company, as our current president plans, I will have no choice but to reduce the size of this company. Okay, so that's Elaine, that's the plaintiffs, that's JCN, the people that filed it. Let's talk about the judge a little bit. Let's see who he is. A Donald Trump appointed judge, Mark T. Pittman, of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas, has indicated he wants to fast track the block. Pittman is one of 200 Trump appointed federal judges, a group that includes nearly as many appeals court judges as Barack Obama appointed in both of his terms. So, not just one, but both. Given Pittman's right wing associations, student debt relief proponents are concerned that his conservative bent could lead to this case being upheld. So some other things he's done, Pittman struck down a Texas law banning people under the age of 21 from carrying handguns, citing a foundationary history and tradition. He's all good with kids carrying guns. Mark also rejected the DOJ's attempt to disqualify a high-ranking Trump administration lawyer from an immigration case. Pittman rejected the DOJ's arguments about side-switching finding that it's not unusual for government lawyers to later vehemently oppose the government. The judge also warned lawyers about using the court to advance political arguments, as he's using the court to advance political arguments. He also ordered the FDA to make public the data it relied on to license Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccination, imposing a dramatically accelerated schedule that should result in the release of all information within about eight months. That's roughly 75 years faster than the FDA said it would take to complete a Freedom of Information Act request, or FOIA, by a group of doctors and scientists seeking an estimated 450,000 pages of material about the vaccine. The FDA didn't dispute it had an obligation to make the information public, but argued that its short-staffed FOIA office only had the bandwidth to review and release 500 pages a month while Pittman recognized the unduly burdensome challenges that the FOIA request may present to the FDA. In his four-page order, he resoundingly rejected the agency's suggested schedule. Rather than producing 500 pages a month, the FDA's proposed timeline, he ordered the agency to turn over 55,000 a month. That is our 
Texas lawsuit and the players at hand. Now on to the second lawsuit. That's the one with the state. The states involved, of course, are Nebraska, because we don't have anything better to do out here, Missouri, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, and South Carolina. So the debt relief program was initially halted by an appeals court in late October following an emergency request filed from six Republican-led states who argued that the president does not have the authority to wipe out debt, and it should be left to Congress to make that decision. The court is considering the request by the states for an injunction. That lawsuit was filed on behalf of Republican Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds and by six Republican Attorney Generals. The state of Nebraska Attorney General Douglas J. Peterson, the state of Missouri Attorney General Eric S. Schmidt, the state of Arkansas Attorney General Leslie Rutledge, the state of Iowa Solicitor General Jeffrey S. Thompson, and the state of Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt, and the state of South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson. The U.S. District Judge Henry Autry, an appointed judge of former President J.W. Bush of Eastern District Court of Missouri, issued a 19-page ruling that declared that those states didn't have legal standing to sue the Biden administration over its student debt cancellation program, despite the importance and significant challenges that they have risen in the case. In the Autry's decision, he seemed to argue with the attorneys that from the Biden administration that a potential loss of tax revenue in the future did not give the states enough standing to sue. But the St. Louis-based 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals disagreed with that ruling, finding that Missouri showed that it is likely to be financially harmed from Biden's loan forgiveness plan and that a court ruling could avert that outcome. So it blocked the program while it hears an appeal by the states. The appeals court ruled that this relationship gives Missouri standing to sue though it did not decide whether Biden's plan is legal. Missouri operates public entities that service or own student loan debt servicers, such as the Missouri Higher Education Loan Authority, are legally and contractually obligated to pay all of the administration costs associated with servicing the loans. This obligation includes communicating with borrowers, tracking payments, evaluating whether borrowers qualify for various deferral and forgiveness programs, providing borrowers with all the information they need to make the decisions about their loans and reporting all this information to the federal government. This means that whenever the administration makes a change to loan programs, these servicers bear a huge administrative costs. In exchange for all their work, servicers are paid a small amount of money per month per loan. The life of these loans that aren't entirely forgiven by the government will be shortened, which means that the income streams they generate or servicers also will be shortened. States use the money made by their servicers to invest in other state programs. When servicers such as Missouri Higher Education Loan Authority lose money, those state programs lose money too. Other states such as Arkansas operate public entities that own federal student loan debt. The Arkansas Student Loan Authority, for example, gets paid based on how many loans that it holds. Biden announced that he isn't going to forgive any of the kinds of loans that are held by Arkansas Student Loan Authority, so they shouldn't count and don't seem to be affected, but they're still appealing. Nebraska invests their state pension funds in securities that are backed by student loan assets. Biden's loan forgiveness plan will cause investors in those securities to receive their money back earlier than anticipated, which will reduce their income streams it also may cause the market for these securities to decline, lowering the value of Nebraska's investments. Steve Vladek, a professor at the University of Texas of Law, said during a Wednesday press call that every case filed in a federal court has to demonstrate that the plaintiff would be injured by the policy, that the injury can be directly traced back to the defendant, and that the relief they are seeking would address those injuries. But the harms MOLA could suffer are unknown and Missouri itself is not harmed directly and the indirect harm Missouri suffers through the harm to MOLA is speculative at best. And the Justice Department wrote in its filing, four of the states, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Carolina, said the debt relief would also hurt their tax revenues because their state tax codes chose to include debt relief as gross income even though federal law prevents debt relief from being taxed through 2025. So that's the lawsuit of the states. 
who are the people that are involved with this lawsuit? Let's see if we notice anything. Let's, let's take a gander and see what we notice. What stands out? Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds immediately criticized the plan as a misuse of government overreach. However, Iowa's state auditor has again called for her to return nearly $450,000 in federal coronavirus relief funds that were supposed to pay 21 governor office staff members for three months in 2020. The governor's staff salaries, though, had already been considered in creating her budget prior to the pandemic, making them ineligible for payment out of the federal pandemic relief money. Treasury officials told the Reynolds administration last November the failure to provide documentation upon request of the auditor can result in non-compliance. In 2018, Reynolds proposed cutting $2 million for Medicaid, which cares for eligible low-income adults, children, pregnant women, elderly adults, and people with disabilities. Reynolds' proposed restructuring of the state tax code would represent a further reduction to income taxes for the top bracket, going beyond the 2018 legislation, including a cut in the rate for the top bracket from 9% to 5.5%. That was the largest income tax cut in Iowa history. Her opposed sales tax increase, however, was largely opposed by state legislators. Reynolds is a staunch supporter of Donald Trump. She blocked the two-thirds request from Democratic State Attorney General Tom Miller to join the multi-state lawsuit challenging Trump administration policies or to submit amicus briefs and such suits. Among the vetoed requests were proposals to challenge Trump's policies related to immigration, asylum, abortion, birth control, environmental deregulation, gun policy, and LGBT rights. Reynolds blocked Miller from including Iowa in a legal challenge to the Trump's administration repeal of the Clean Power Plan, an Obama-era regulation that restricted emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon to counteract climate change. In 2018, she acknowledged that Trump's trade and tariffs policies were hurting American farmers as agriculture experts declined due to tariffs imposed by other nations in retaliation for Trump's tariffs, but then claimed that farmers would ultimately benefit. Reynolds made campaign appearances with Trump during the 2020 presidential campaign. In the November election, Trump carried Iowa but lost nationally to Joe Biden, who won both the electoral vote and the national popular vote. After Trump's loss, Reynolds did not denounce the president's claims of election fraud and refused to acknowledge Biden's victory until January of 2021. But she condemned the, the storming of the Capitol, which disrupted the counting of the electoral votes, but said many people believe that the election was just not valid and they were innocent people. Also in May of 2018, she signed the fetal heartbeat bill, one of the nation's most restrictive abortion bans. In January 2019, an Iowa state judge struck that law down as unconstitution, in which Reynolds chose not to appeal, saying she did not believe that losing a legal battle would advance the anti-abortion cause. She has repeatedly called for an amendment to the state constitution to the effect that it does not protect abortion rights. From 2017 to April of 2020, Reynolds restored the voting rights of 543 felons, more than roughly 200 restorations that her predecessor gave over almost seven years in office. In August of 2020, she signed an executive order permitting felons to vote in Iowa elections upon completion of their sentence. Iowa previously imposed a lifetime ban on felons voting unless the governor personally restored their voting rights. This was the strictest law in the country. Explaining her order, Reynolds referred to her experiences two decades earlier when she twice pleaded guilty to DUI and subsequently recovered from alcoholism, an experience she cites as an important turning point in her life. In March of 2021, Reynolds gave into a law that shortened the hours of polling places on election day reduced early voting period, and required that absentee ballots be received by ballot places before the end of election day. She said the legislation would protect election integrity. It was part of a wider effort by Republicans across the country to roll back voting access. Democrats won the 2020 presidential election, with Trump and many other Republicans making false claims of fraud. On April 2nd, 2021, Reynolds signed a bill allowing individuals to purchase and carry handguns without a permit policy known as a constitutional carry. Later that month, she signed a les legislation that would allow landlords to reject tenants who pay rent with Section 8 vouchers. In April of 2020, on the advice of native Iowan actor and entrepreneur Ashton Kutcher, 
Reynolds signed a contract with Utah startup Nomi Health to develop a COVID-19 testing program called Test Iowa. She was eventually sued for refusing to release public records related to that $26 million no-bid contract that they signed. Solicitor General Jeffrey S. Thompson, he is 64 of Des Moines, and he was charged with assault, a simple misdemeanor, and the disturbance at a blazing saddles in East Village. The criminal complaint accuses Thompson of swinging multiple times with a closed fist at a bouncer who was trying to escort him out of the bar. Based on the state's employee salary book for the 2020 fiscal year, fewer than 10% of the department's workforce received a request to resign in January 2023. These types of changes aren't uncommon after a statewide office flips party affiliation, said the changes is similar to leadership changing at federal agencies when a new president is elected. More people are more likely to retire from those offices as well. And according to an official from the outgoing attorney general's office, Solicitor General Jeff Thompson had previously announced his retirement and therefore was never asked to resign. Attorney General Doug J. Peterson of Nebraska in July of 2017 threatened that he would litigate if the president did not terminate the DACA policy been put in place by President Obama. A legal accountability group is charging that Doug used his elective office to propagate the lies and misinformation that imperil American democracy and discredit the 2020 election. The 65 Project, named after the 65 unsuccessful lawsuits filed by former Donald Trump supporters to overturn his 2020 defeat. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the Texas lawsuit on the basis that Texas, as well as Nebraska, had no standing to challenge the election results in other states. In October of 2015, Texas, Kansas, and Louisiana filed a federal lawsuit, which Nebraska and Wisconsin later joined over a part of the Affordable Care Act, which requires states to pay a portion of the health insurance providers to help fund the health insurance law. They joined a legal push urging the U.S. Supreme Court to back the First Amendment rights of business owners who wish to refuse services to customers that contradict their religious beliefs. The amicus brief initiated or originated in Colorado, where the owner of a graphic and web design company is suing for the right to deny building websites for same-sex couples as she expands into the business of creating wedding websites. Okay, so that's like a quick little thing him. Attorney General Eric S. Smith has filed lawsuits to have the Affordable Care Act invalidated by courts. He has sued school districts and municipalities for implementing mask requirements during the COVID-19 pandemic, sued the Biden administration for its environmental policies, and signed on to the amicus brief that argued that LGBT people are not protected by workplace discrimination bans. And he filed a lawsuit against China's handling of the pandemic making Missouri the first U.S. state to do so. After Joe Biden won the 2020 election and Trump refused to concede, Schmidt joined with the other Republicans in claiming fraud and joined the lawsuits to try and invalidate the 2020 elections. Missouri is one of more than a dozen states with the trigger law banning virtually all abortions. Said he plans to sue Kansas City, saying the city's plan amounts to a use of taxpayer funds for abortions which is prohibited under state's law. The Kansas City Resolution states that the reimbursement is not to be funded by taxpayers, but does not specify from where the funds are to come from. Then we have Attorney General Leslie Rutledge. In 2016, Rutledge stated that she would appeal a ruling supporting LGBT anti-discrimination laws enacted in Fayetteville, Arkansas, then in opposition to a state law prohibiting these ordinances. In July 2017, threatened that they would litigate if the president did not terminate the DACA policy that had been put in place by President Barack Obama. When the Supreme Court of the United States handed down its decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health Organization, Rutledge led Arkansas to become one of the first states to outlaw abortions, except to save the life of the mother. Arkansas Act 180 of 2019 effectively outlawed abortion upon the Attorney General's certification that the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade. A lawsuit alleges that Leslie Rutledge misuses her office to promote her political aspirations and illegally use taxpayer money. The lawsuit filed in Pulaski County Circuit Court in Little Rock alleges Rutledge overstepped her authority by supporting failed lawsuits seeking to overturn presidential election results in Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, 
and media advertisements in which she discusses her office's services. Rutledge engaged in highly partisan political activities as Attorney General of the State of Arkansas in order to further her political standing and to promote her own personal political ambitions, and at the expense of taxpayers of Arkansas, according to the lawsuit. Rutledge denies the allegations calling them politically motivated, said spokesman Stephanie Sharp. The lawsuit seeks in order that Rutledge be prohibited from exceeding her authority and to repay about $1.7 million for the media advertisements. Attorney General Derek Schmidt in 2020, after Republican President Donald Trump was defeated by Joe Biden, he refused to acknowledge defeat and filed a lawsuit to affect and overturn the election results. Schmidt defended the state's laws against same-sex marriages and challenged public health orders issued by Governor Laura Kelly to address the COVID-19 pandemic. In July of 2017, he threatened that he would litigate if the president did not terminate the DACA policy that had been put into place during President Obama, was a supporter of the highly popular Kansas version of the Jessica's Law, but almost single-handedly killed the final bill by demanding an inclusion of a provision allowing private prisons in Kansas. Schmidt joined with other Republican state attorneys in challenging federal regulatory actions adopted by the Obama administration that Schmidt contended were illegal federal overreach. Schmidt and his colleagues were successful in blocking many of these regulations particularly those proposed by the Environmental Protection Agency. Kansas challenged Obama-era regulations on the oil and gas industry, including a regulation controlling emission of the greenhouse gas methane. One of Schmidt's first acts as a state attorney general was to add Kansas as a plaintiff to the lawsuit, challenging the constitutionality of Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act. The U.S. Supreme Court ultimately upheld most of the ACA Constitution while striking down a portion of the law which required states to implement Medicaid expansion. In a Planned Parenthood, Kansas and Mid-Missouri v. Anderson, the U.S. Supreme Court of Appeals of the Tenth Circuit Court ruled in favor of Planned Parenthood, who challenged the decision of Kansas government officials to terminate Medicaid contracts with the organization Schmidt asked the U.S. Supreme Court to reverse the Tenth Circuit's decision, but in December 2018, the Supreme Court denied his petition. Now on to Attorney General Alan Wilson, who is the Attorney General of South Carolina. Wilson is litigated to block same-sex marriage, invalidate the Affordable Care Act, challenge the Joe Biden administration's environmental regulations, defend anti-abortion laws, and prohibit mass mandates, and vaccine requirements. He has advocated against marijuana decriminalization, as well as DACA. In 2013, Wilson self-reported his campaign failed to report at least 84 contributions and expenditures on required public records. A further investigation completed in March of 2013 revealed that at least 68 unreported contributions and 16 unreported expenditures. On January 12th of 2012, Wilson falsely claimed on Fox Media that we found that there were over 900 people who died and subsequently voted. The number could be even higher than that. These claims were untrue, and an exhaustive investigation by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division found no evidence to support the claims of zombie voters in South Carolina. In January 2018, after a two-year investigation, a state grand jury issued a 270-page grand jury report on corruption in South Carolina, including blurred relationships between businesses, legislators, lobbyists, and political consultants in the state. The grand jury determined that Wilson's failure to act following the guilty plea of former state's House Speaker Bobby Harrell and two other state legislators impeded an investigation into state government corruption. The investigation and the report focused in part on Wilson's close ties to Richard Quinn, a prominent Republican political strategist in the state, and his son, Rick Quinn Jr., who had been a member of the state's house. The report mentioned the Quinns and suggested misconduct by the younger Quinn. Pasco urged the AG's office to investigate the Quinns after Harrell entered a guilty plea to misusing campaign money and resigning from the house in late 2014. Pasco emailed the attorney general's office urging the Quinns to be investigated. Wilson attempted to fire Pasco, triggering a political firestorm in the state. Adam Piper, a Wilson aide, launched a secret effort to smear Pasco. Pasco challenged Wilson's attempt to fire him, 
taking the position that the Attorney General could not do so after previously recusing himself on the grounds of a conflict of interest. In July of 2016, South Carolina Supreme Court sided with Pasco on a 4-1 decision, rejecting Wilson's attempt to fire him as a special prosecutor. Ultimately, the younger Rick Quinn resigned from the office and pleaded guilty to a reduced charge, while the elder Quinn agreed to testify before the state grand jury and his consulting firm pleaded guilty to failing to register as a lobbyist. In advance of the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol by a pro-Trump mob, made robocalls encouraging patriots to march on Washington and demand that Congress overturn the election results and keep Trump in power. Five South Carolina attorneys subsequently filed complaints with the South Carolina Office of Disciplinary Counsel against Wilson, alleging that his participation in the Trump conspiracy lawsuit was an abuse of office that attempted to disenfranchise voters and had an effect of inflaming the subsequent insurrection. Wilson denied any wrongdoing. So those are the people that filed on behalf of the states. From what I can tell, they are all avid Trump supporters that they believe in following the constitution until Trump says that it's bad and then they think that it needs to be changed. They believe in tax cuts for the rich, but not helping the poor. They only care about babies being born, but not services to help the poor and the children or parents. Some other lawsuits filed against Biden's loan forgiveness program, but have been dismissed due to lack of standing like the Brown County Taxpayers Association in Wisconsin, an organization that, that advocates for conservative economic policy on behalf of its members, brought an emergency request to block the program to Justice Amy Cohen Barrett, who is assigned to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, but was denied. The individual borrower who filed suit in December, Frank Garrison, argued that he had standing because Biden's plan will saddle him with a large tax liability and that his loans are already going to be forgiven under a different program for those who work in public service jobs. Under the law of the state where Garrison lives, his public interest loan forgiveness isn't treated as taxable income, but the forgiveness he would get under Biden's plan would be treated as taxable income. So the only thing that Garrison will get from the Biden's plan is a steep tax bill, according to him. But the fact that you can opt out of the program caused it to be thrown out as well as dismissed. The Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, sued the Biden administration on, on October 18th, arguing the relief plan could undermine an existing program that allows borrowers to have their debt cleared after a decade of qualifying payments if they become a government employee or nonprofit workers. The PSLF program is a key way to make nonprofits like the Cato Institute appealing for workers. The organization argued by providing across the board debt relief, the challenge scheme substantially alters those incentives and frustrates Congress's goal of making nonprofit employment relatively more attractive to holders of student loan debt. The Cato Institute said in its complaint, this is still pending in appeals. Arizona Attorney General Mark Bronovich sued the Biden administration over the loan forgiveness plan on September 30th, arguing it will harm the state in several ways. For one, it will make it harder for the state government to recruit workers who can have their debts cleared after making a decade of qualifying payments under the existing federal program. According to the lawsuit, said that widespread debt cancellation will make the program less appealing. Following the midterm elections, newly installed Arizona Democratic Attorney General Chris Mays formally dismissed the suit at the end of January. And now, being February 2023, when I will hopefully be getting this out, it might be the beginning of March, hopefully end of February, hopefully, oh God, this can take forever. We know the Supreme Court is going to start hearing oral arguments at the end of the month. I guess we'll stay tuned, see what happens with that. I might do a follow-up video. It will definitely be shorter as I won't have all of the other stuff. I'll refer to this video. If you got to this point, you are awesome, amazing. I appreciate you. This was a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of researching and trying to make sense of it all. I hope that it made sense to you guys. Oh, this was a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, I feel like a lot of this is all just some political bullshit and I got very annoyed at parts. I actually had to walk away a couple of times, had to take a break a couple of days. I also got lost in a few rabbit holes and had to try and find my way back out. <laughs> I do hope that you guys enjoyed this video and maybe you learned something. If I missed anything, let me know in the comments. If there's anything you want to add, let me know in the comments. If you want to tell me about your student loan or if you want to say fuck you, 
I worked my ass off to pay my student loans, you should too. Go ahead, put that in the comments. Please like as it really does help with the algorithm and subscribe if you're not already. Otherwise, thanks for coming back. More story times coming soon, as well as some movie reviews. I heart your faces. I hope to see you next time. Bye, boy, boy, boy.